I really wanted to break this up into two videos, going over them separately with the Emperor's favorite Primarchs, and then on the other hand it was going to be the Primarchs that had plans that outlived the Great Crusade, but after some scripting I've realized that I really can't separate the two. I think it's pretty safe to say that the 2nd and the 11th Legions, as well as their Primarchs, are probably the Emperor's least favorites, as they didn't even make it to the start of the Great Crusade, let alone to the end. I'm also just gonna go out on a limb here and say that there are probably a couple more we could add to the list of least favorites. Um, I'm pretty sure it's unquestioned that Conrad Kurz is the least favorite of all of the known or accepted or acknowledged Primarchs. Conrad was this really unfortunate situation where no matter what the Emperor did, he wouldn't have been able to break through to that inner sadist within him. Or is it masochist? Either or. There was no getting through to Kurz. Now, I'm gonna group up Fulgrim, Magnus, Peter Turbo, and Mortarian all into one grouping because every single one of them was kind of given the short end of the stick. It almost seemed like the Emperor wanted them to fall because they all had some glaring flaw within them. Fulgrim, in his pursuit of perfection, would be an extremely easy target to manipulate, and I figured that the Emperor planned for this. He knew that Fulgrim would be easy to manipulate, Magnus, his hubris, would get in the way of everything. Perturabo and Mortarion are where it gets a little weird because they are both extremely enduring fighters. Both of them were described as unstoppable forces, but both of them also has a glaring flaw. Perturabo can't communicate his feelings, despite being able to speak three different languages and being able to reconstruct anything just from looking at it. He can't figure out how to have a conversation, and Mortarion is just brooding from Barbarus. Lorgar and Angron is where it gets kind of weird because... The Emperor was genuinely upset when he got to Nuceria, and he saw that there was no way he could save Angron. And keep in mind, they tried. The Emperor had tons of custodians, some of the best medical techs, uh, if you could call them that, within the Imperium, and nobody can figure out how to safely remove the Butcher's Nails. I'm not even going to start on Lorgar because... That's its own bucket of worms. That guy, there was no helping. He was so horny for a god that he was going to find one, even if he had to make one. And I also want to add Ferris Manus to the list because I think that there was a plan for Ferris Manus to survive, but at the end of the day, it's, it's kind of up in the air. He's had maybe two books written about him, and half of those books aren't even about him. So, we just don't know. It also has to be said that we don't know if Ferris Manus is leading the Legion of the Damned, but if he is leading the Legion of the Damned, then we know that the Emperor either planned on him dying, or just made the most of him dying. Either way, it's making the best out of a bad situation. Now we're getting into the list of people who I think were meant to survive the Great Crusade, but didn't really have any plans after the fact, if that makes sense. Like Jagatai Khan, for example. After the Crusade, there was essentially nothing Jagatai Khan could do aside from just circle the Imperium or go around the various borders of the Imperium, riding out, destroying Chaos or pirates or whatever renegades were calling for it. Now, Horus is a weird one. I probably should have brought him up before Jagatai, but we're getting there now. It does really feel like the Emperor knew Horus was going to fall, and that's why he got to Chthonia first and sent uh, Horus to Chthonia. I'm a personal believer that the Emperor sent all of his kids to these different worlds. I know that's not definitive canon, but that's just my beliefs, my headcanon. That being said, I do think that the Emperor viewed Horus as the sacrificial king, as Chaos views him. I'm not 100% sure on this though, as there might be plans for Horus way, way down the line, considering the Emperor said that he would wait for him, but uh, again, that's just theory at this point. I'm going to be going over the Loyalist Primarchs, or the ones that I believe had plans for after the Crusade in the order that they were found, because I have tried doing this without looking at the wiki and I always forget at least one of them. So, Lehman Russ. Uh, I am almost 100% certain that Lehman Russ was going to be by the Emperor's side for as long as he lived. He was going to remain by the Emperor's side as his executioner for as long as his twin hearts would keep beating. Now, Vulcan. Uh, Vulcan obviously had plans well, well beyond the Great Crusade. He's the only perpetual, and he's the most human. Not only that, he is probably the only person who would be able to craft weapons better than the Emperor, or weapons that the Emperor could use. All things that are extremely, extremely important, and 
why would you give someone the gift of being a perpetual if you didn't even plan on having them live for 20,000 years? Rebute and Rogaldorn are both going to go in the same spot. Both of them were most likely going to either lead the Administratum or the Astra Militarum. There was always going to be something for them. Rebute would either be ensuring that supply lines or logistics or the overall quality of life within the Imperium would keep on improving. Dorn, as the Praetorian of Terra, would almost 100% be in charge of defenses across the entire Imperium. And now we get to Sanguinius, probably the entire reason why I made this video. I think that Sanguinius is almost the exact same piece that Horus is, except for the other side. Sanguinius is the sacrificial king for the Loyalists. I think a lot of my reason for believing this is because before the Great Crusade, the Emperor was always doing things with this Red Angel, and in my eyes, that Red Angel is either an aspect of what would later become Sanguinius, or it's the aspect of Sanguinius' soul that was pulled out of the warp. Either way, Sanguinius was most likely meant to die, otherwise he would have been War Master. And the last two I'm going to bring up, well, technically three, because it's the Hydra, Alpharius Omegon, which might actually just be Alpharius, or just Omegon. Either way, we're not getting into that. These three, I believe, were the, outside of Vulcan, those who had the most staying power within the Imperium, who had the most job stability, you could say. If these three Primarchs work together, I believe that they could have Chaos largely under wraps within just about a century. Alpharius, Omegon, and the rest of the Alpha Legion could infiltrate, and then Corvus Corax could come in, assassinate who needs to be assassinated, and those Alpha Legionnaires who gave them the information can keep their identities a secret. They can keep lying in cover even after the fact with nobody being any the wiser. It also has to be said that maybe Alpharius had the most time with the Emperor, uh, uh, maybe, because everything he says is a lie, but it is unquestionable that the Emperor was a big fan of, I'm going to take the words out of Isander and Coda's mouth, the CIA faction. The Emperor needed eyes and ears everywhere, and with humanity spread all throughout the galaxy, you would need a force like the Alpha Legion to ensure that every single planet or every single nook and cranny of this universe or galaxy-spanning empire was maintained properly, that there was no attempts at usurpation or anything of the sort. These three combined are quite literally the dream team for the loyalists of the Imperium. These three working together, there is almost nothing that couldn't be solved. They would know, Corvus Corex would know exactly when to show up, from what shadow to pop out of, and he wouldn't have even needed to know anything about this beforehand. Alpharius Omegon could just shoot him a little message, he'll pop out of the shadow, kill a guy, pop back, problem solved. I think it's pretty safe to say that either Alpharius Omegon, whatever one of them or both of them is alive, Corvus Corax, the Lion, and Vulcan are the Emperor's five favorite Primarchs, without a doubt. It has to be said that the Lion and Corvus Corax are the only Primarchs that we know of that have actually seen the closest thing to the Emperor's true visage. The Lion and Corax both looked at the Emperor and saw a normal looking dude and then a frame later, they saw the golden visage of the Emperor. They are the only two, outside of maybe Magnus, but I'll go into that after this, who have actually seen the somewhat true visage of the Emperor. And an argument could be made that Magnus might have seen the true visage of the Emperor, but all he would have seen would be whatever the Emperor decided to project into the warp. Yes, that's probably closer to the true visage of the Emperor, but it's not breaking the facade like it was with Corax and the Lion. It makes perfect sense for Corvus Corax to see the quote-unquote true visage of the Emperor because he is the only Primarch who was actually given true information about the warp unbridled. The Emperor clearly knew that Corvus Corax was going to serve a purpose in the warp and that he was going to be detrimental. Why else would he be the only Primarch gifted with the information of the Primarch project? I also think it has to be said that with the Lion being as similar to the Emperor as he is, the Emperor is going to keep him around. Having someone that you don't even so much as have to speak to, just share a glance with, and essentially an entire conversation's worth of dialogue can be had, you want to keep them around. That is as close as it gets to the Emperor's right hand. And again, Vulcan's an easy one, just he's a perpetual. You don't make someone unkillable if you didn't plan on having them live literally forever. 
but I also stand by the fact that all of the Primarchs that fell to Chaos fell for a reason. The Emperor made sure that they had some glaring weakness so that way when they did fall, there would be something for the Imperium to exploit. With Angron, I don't think the Emperor planned on him falling, but he made the most out of it. He could have just outright killed Angron on the spot, realizing that there was no good he could provide for the Imperium, but instead, he allowed Angron to be taken over by Khorne because the Emperor understood that even the Blood God would not be able to turn Angron into a precise weapon like the rest of the Primarchs were. Angron is essentially a nuke and the Emperor needed a chisel. But yeah, if it's not obvious by now, Mortarian and Corvus Corax are my favorites. There's just something about the underdogs that it really resonates with me. I think it's something psychological. I know it's the human condition to really want to root for the underdogs, but you know, I, I like to believe that they're just the objective best.